Hi, this is Gary Collins, the creator of the Primal Power Method, and this is episode two of my financial health series. And I'm here again with Sean Perkins uh, with Principal Shield Financial Services. Thanks for coming on, Sean. We're going to talk about how to pay, how you pay your taxes uh, will cause you to lose money, right? Or gain money, depending on how you do it. Well, that is true. Um, we talked in the first episode about different ways that people lose money. Uh, we mentioned that the mortgage, how they choose to structure and pay for their mortgages, number one, uh, very close second, if not even bigger than that, is how they choose to pay their taxes. And what I mean by that, it's often confusing when people hear me say that, is that the IRS gives us choice and control as to how, when, or if we choose to pay taxes on our accounts. And if we don't understand that, then we, we do what everybody else does, and that can end up costing us a fortune. And so what I mean by that is we, we invest money largely in accounts that are taxable uh, at the time that you earn interest. So you're in a savings account, a checking account, you're in the stock market, mutual funds, those kinds of things. Each year, those uh, institutions that you have your money send you an IRS 1098 form, which is telling you how much interest you earned that year, and you report that interest on your taxes annually, and you pay the interest. Most people don't feel the impact of that because it just simply decreases the amount of refund that you're going to get if you are getting a refund, or it increases the amount that you have to pay if you write a check. Um, and, and, and many times we don't take the taxes out of the account with which we earn the interest, and we write that check for the taxes out of our lifestyle. We, we pay for it from our checking account or it reduces the refund. So we don't really feel the impact of it. Well, that's the first way that we, we can pay taxes that we don't otherwise need to pay by having our money in accounts that we pay taxes on as the interest is earned. Uh, piggybacking on that is most people, when they have money in savings accounts, CDs, checking accounts, or in the stock market or mutual funds, we allow whatever our gains are to reinvest into that account. And we call yeah. that compound interest. Yeah. Well, compound interest is a wonderful thing in and of itself, but it can create another problem as well, which is increased taxes. Ah. Because now your interest is earning interest, which is good. That's the compound interest part of it. But then now that makes your account grow at a faster pace. And because your money is growing in a taxable account, your tax liability is increasing. Most people would think, oh, I don't mind. I'll pay more tax if I'm earning more money. But again, you will get to a point over time where the amount of tax that's owed becomes very cost prohibitive because if it's coming out of your tax refund, eventually it will eat the whole refund up. If it's not coming out of a refund, but it's more money that you have to pay when you file your taxes, that money has to come from somewhere. Not many people have that much money laying around to pay their tax bill. Yeah. So it can become a rather sizable problem because you're not taking the money out of the account to pay the taxes, it's coming out of lifestyle. So that's that. Those are two big ways that we lose money with how we choose to pay our taxes. Yeah, and that's very interesting. I've uh, I've gotten out of all of my investments. I still own some stocks, but I noticed a lot of investments are like double taxation. Most of them, you, you know, because you pay taxes on the money that you earn, and then if you invest it and you have a gain, a capital gain, you pay taxes on that gain again. And I've always thought that is such a crappy system um, because I've already paid taxes on that money. That's my money. And if I make gains on it, well, I've already paid taxes. It would be as if I sold a car and, or bought my car. I pay taxes on it. And then when I go to sell it again, I got to pay taxes on it again. You know, that's how I look at it. And uh, for that, that's why I've changed my investment strategy a lot. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. no expert. I've handled my own finances, but uh, I'm soon going to get out of that, and uh, you will be probably handling all my that down the road when I have <laughs> some more money and I'm not building houses off the grid and doing all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but for people, what would you say for a 401k? Would you still recommend that, even though it's uh, defer? You pay the taxes up front, but on the withdrawals down the road, when you hit what is it? Is it 57 and a half or what is it? What's 59 the age? And a half. 59, 59 and a half. half. That's when you have access to the money without the early withdrawal penalty. So let's talk about that. Tax, uh, I mean, 401ks, that was, a, that was the next area where people choose to pay their taxes. It can be harmful to them. 
uh, 401ks and IRAs and, and other accounts like that, 457 plans, 403Bs, they're all under a, an umbrella called um, qualified plans, okay? Qualified with who should be the question everybody's asking, and, yeah. and that's qualified with the government. Um, they're great plans uh, because they allow you to invest money pre-tax, prior to being taxed, into an account, and then they allow the growth that's in that account to defer the taxes as well. And so the question is, to when? You'll pay the tax on that money when you withdraw it from the account. If you withdraw it from the account prior to 59 and a half, you'll pay a 10% penalty. early withdrawal yeah. penalty. That's a pretty stiff fine, if you will, for accessing your money prior to when the government wants you to. But then when you pull the money out after 59 and a half, you'll have to pay ordinary income tax on that, which is whatever your highest tax bracket is at the time that you withdraw the money. Well, everybody thinks when they're making investments in terms of the immediate 12 to 24 months surrounding their lives, surrounding that decision. What I mean by that is we believe that tax rates today are going to be the same tax rates in 25 years from now. And that may or may not be true. And in fact, if I had the opportunity to show you a tax chart, you would see quite uh, uh, readily that it's not the case. We're actually in one of the lowest tax environments, income tax environments that we've been in in the last 50 years or more. And so I asked this question of people that are investing in tax deferred vehicles. Okay. And I'll ask you this right now, Gary. What do you believe the future of tax rates is going to be? Are they going to be higher than they are today? Are they going to be lower than they are today? Are they going to be the same as they are today? I would say the way the federal government works and the way state and county, I have no idea. <laughs> it's pie in well, the sky. I couldn't even begin to predict what our governments are going to do anymore. But if I had to just throw a wild guess out there, I would say it's going to go up. Yeah, and, and I was going to say, right when you were talking about that, I was going to say, your gut, uh, you know your gut is telling you that future tax rates will be higher. Yeah. They'll be higher for a very uh, wide array of reasons, not the least of which is Social Security. We keep hearing everybody talking yeah. about Social Security, and we have the largest uh, group of people, the baby boomers, retiring in our nation's history. Right now we have 10,000 people a day retiring, baby boomers, and th they're all drawing Social Security. All of those folks that are drawing Social Security are also going on Medicare. And so Medicare is another thing that's going to cost a lot of money as people go, uh, you know, grow older and go forward. Uh, you have two wars with Iran, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan that we just got through that traditionally when you look at our nation's tax rates, anytime we're involved in any kind of a war, police action, conflict of some kind, tax rates always increase because we have to pay for the war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after 2011, I mean, uh, 2001, right, 9-11, we couldn't raise tax rates because our economy was in too fragile of a state to raise taxes. So what do we do? We put our wars on the credit card. And that's why we went from owing $6 trillion in national debt to now we're at $18 trillion in national debt. T, trillion with a T, not billion with a B, trillion. That's a number that we had not heard prior to the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and now we're seeing trillion dollar deficits every year. Uh, now, I think we've this year we've kind of curbed that down a little bit, but that doesn't change the fact that for however many years in a row we've been having trillion dollar deficits, which adds to the debt. Taxes have to go up because where does the re where does the government generate revenue to pay our debts, to pay our pay for our social programs? Taxes. Yep. It's the only way they get money. Yeah. So they have to go up. Now, how much are they going to go? It's anybody's guess, but it's going to be fairly significant. And when you when you listen to comments from people like Nancy Pelosi say, we wouldn't have a problem anymore if taxes would just remain or would return to historical levels. Well, most people don't understand what historical levels mean. Historical levels has our average tax rate over the last hundred years that our taxes have been in place is 60 percent. We're at 39.6 in the highest bracket right now. That's a significant increase. So. Tax-deferred vehicles, when you pull money out of tax-deferred vehicles in the future, you will pay the taxes at that higher tax rate when you could have otherwise paid the taxes today at what would arguably be your lowest tax rate. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's going to cause a lot of problems for people, and they're not going to find out about it when it's too late, until it's too late to do anything about it. Yeah. That's very, very true. Um, it, it's tricky, and I tell people when it gets into taxes – and actually, I had it backwards uh, – a 401k is tax deferred. A, a, I know Roth, what you mean. a Roth is where you pay the taxes up front. You're taking that Correct. money and then you don't pay taxes when you withdraw. I Correct. had it backwards. Um, 
But with that, there's, you know, one of the best, the best advice I got early on in life, um, as I tried starting my small businesses in my uh, late twenties, I want to say early thirties was that always have a good accountant. And I will say that holds true. I have saved a ton of money on paying taxes and what I owe far as because without a good accountant. And they're not, I'm not talking about, you know, a, I'm not rich by any stretch. You know, I don't have these, you know, these shields and tax shields and, and havens that I can use like, you know, Mitt Romney or someone. I don't have that. I'm an average everyday person. But there's a lot of things that a trained professional accountant uh, that works, you know, a CPA knows that the average lower end accountant, H R H and R Block or something like that, doesn't know. And it's especially true if you're an entrepreneur and you have businesses. Right. That's where it gets tricky. And understanding what is a write off, what isn't, and keeping you out of trouble. That's another thing too. I know people who run their own businesses who do their own taxes. I would not want that liability ever. You know, pay the you know pay the five hundred thousand bucks a year, whatever it is, to have an accountant. It, you know, and I think that's an important uh, part of it too. Uh, uh, how you pay your taxes is well, that guy, that professional is going to tell you how you're going to pay your taxes mm -hmm. and take care of you. Um, when it gets into it, I mean, like I said, I I consider myself a fairly smart guy. I'm not a rocket scientist by any stretch, but. When it comes to taxes and understanding how they work and investments, they're tricky for a reason. You know, the sure. government wants to get as much money as they can out of you. Bottom line. Well, that that yeah. points to another uh, something we'll cover in the next episode. But uh, the way the government writes the tax code is so that the average Joe can't understand it. Oh yeah. There's a reason. There's a reason why because it generates additional tax revenue, fines, and penalties. So I hate to think. That I don't want everybody to believe that we're conspiracy theorists, but the point is we've been around a long time. We've seen enough of this to know that it's it's true. And when you're on my side of the desk and you know the tax codes and you know the investments, you can tell the IRS has written them the way they've written, the way they've written them for a reason, or the government, I should yeah. say. Well, and they're written by attorneys. And you know, I spent a good portion of my life working with attorneys, and I worked with the IRS. I used yeah. to have, my investigations ran uh, with the IRS were involved in my cases. And watching how it worked was mind-boggling. I, I, they have to know so much, and they can never know it all. But yeah. if if they want to get you, they can get you. I mean, the, sure. the, the codes are written that way, and that's why I always tell people, don't play around with with your taxes. Don't try and cut corners. Don't Last try, knock say, anybody wants on the door is from the IRS. Yeah, and trust me, I've had friends it's happened to. I've I've had friends who own businesses it's happened to, and it's a nightmare. You know, it, you, you can have whatever belief system in the government you want, but you better pay your taxes and do it right. And mm -hmm. that's the whole thing where Mitt Romney got blasted and some of the other people on, you know, the Clintons, everyone. It doesn't matter what party, but they make so much money, and the tax laws are written to their benefit, more more or less, and they have the ability to pay high-end accountants and attorneys to get through the tax law and find all the loopholes. We right. don't, you know, and that's that's just a fact of life, and I always tell people because they think, ah, oh, you know, Gary, you're just wearing your tin hat, and, you know, you're, you're on the brink of anarchy and all this. I'm all, no, 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 no. There's rules to be followed. I am not stupid. Um, you know, there's certain things you don't want to mess with, and one of them's taxes. You do not want to get yourself in trouble, but at the same time, you want to be financially savvy and pay the least amount under the law that you have to. Plain well, and, and that's and that's a point that I want to make is that you don't have to be Mitt Romney or, or Warren Buffett to be able to take advantage of the existing tax code, tax code to your benefit. There are plenty of tax breaks for people in, in yours and mine and our clients' income strata that are available to them that allow them to take advantage of the code and save taxes. You don't have to have exotic vehicles like owning laundromats and all that kind of stuff to shelter your income. There are everyday vehicles available. You mentioned one of them, Roth. A Roth IRA or a Roth 401k allows you to pay the tax on your money today and invest it in an account that grows tax deferred and comes out tax free. That's a wonderful vehicle that's available to a lot of people today. Now, there are phase outs in place for higher income individuals 
But the point is, that's a vehicle that's available to everyday Americans to, to pay taxes at what they believe today might be their lowest rate, so they don't have to pay them later at what they could be a higher rate. Yeah. Um, the problem is, with, that, with Roth, is that on a Roth IRA, for example, they limit your contribution to $5,500 a year. Well, if you put $5,500 a year away and you put it away for you know till you retire, it's not going to be enough for you to retire on. Well, there's a reason why the IRS limited the contribution to 5500 a year because it's such a wonderful way to save for your retirement, right? Yeah. Well, then you look at the Roth 401k doesn't have the same limitation. It follows the same limitations as a regular 401k, but very, very few employers have implemented the use of a Roth 401k because it's administrative cost for them and it's another nightmare because they have to run the parallel programs because you have to offer them both if you offer the, the Roth 401k. So those are ways that people can use to, to lower their taxes, and there are others. But back on ways that we cost ourselves money in a way we hear taxes, we talked in the last uh, episode on mortgages about people prepaying their mortgage. That's one of the ways that people lose money by prepaying their mortgage. They see the front-end benefit of reducing the interest that they pay, but the back side of that or the flip side of that coin is that when you reduce the interest that you pay to the lender, you also reduce the tax deduction that you get for paying that interest and it increases your tax liability. It's not a dollar for dollar increase, but nonetheless, it is an increase in your taxes. And it's not so, – that's a good point and I've never heard anyone implement that difference into the life of the loan. So if you were to pay it off early, what, what would you be losing long term in the tax write-off and what would be your net gain? And I think that's something I've never seen um, because it's complicated. I mean, it depends when you pay it off, you know, how much interest you've already paid and all that. I mean, it's a moving target. Sure. But yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've gone through that one a million times in my head too. And there, there's no – that's why I tell people to find someone like you. I, I mean, I've spent years trying to figure out my own finances and do it the best I can. And I'm lost half the time. You know, it is complicated. And getting in contact with a financial professional, someone who does this for a living, is definitely a good move. Um, I know in the survivalist and self-sufficiency communities I'm in, there are definite financial planners. And we all recommend them because there's other things we would like to do. And instead of spending time trying to go through this maze and juggernaut, of trying to right. figure out what is the right investment, what is the right timing, how should I pay my taxes, when should I pay my tax? You know, there's it goes on and on and on, and it's I think it's just worth the you know peace of mind to know that you have a professional that you can trust, and that's what we work on too. Is we go out and recruit people like you who we trust because there's a lot of just like anything else, there's a lot of scammers out there that will just rip you off. And that's one of the benefits of our communities and what we do and what I believe in in the primal power method, and that is community and bringing in people that you can trust. You know? Sure. Yeah. Well, the two, final, the two final points that I'll make in this area are, uh, are number one, um, what I call opportunity cost. That's okay. the other part of this, this tax equation. If you pay a dollar in taxes that you didn't otherwise have to pay, you not only lost that dollar – but you lost what that dollar would have earned and grown to had you not lost the dollar in the first place. Okay. That sounds confusing. So if you, if you paid a dollar in taxes you didn't have to pay, you lost that dollar. And if you could have invested that dollar in an environment where you could make 5%, you had lost a nickel as well. So you didn't just lose the dollar, you lost the dollar and the nickel. Now, if you make that $100, you make it $1,000, the example becomes more realistic. But I want you to understand that the opportunity cost is what we're talking about. You're losing money in the ways that we're talking about, but you're also losing the interest that those monies could earn. And that compounds to be a rather large uh, uh, number over a lifetime. And that's just looking at one thing like taxes and then looking at another thing, your mortgage, and looking at other different things. And all of them together – turn out to be a rather large number. The last point is something called provisional income. Provisional income is another uh, thing that people don't understand, and it's an income that means that part of your, supple um, part of your Social Security will become taxable. Right now, if you don't make enough money and you get Social Security, you don't pay any tax on your Social Security. But income from uh, earned income, your job, income from a pension, 
income from IRAs and 401ks, interest on your investments, interest and dividends, those are all labeled as, as what's called provisional income. So when you're collecting Social Security, the government looks at your provisional income and your Social Security and decides, based on those numbers, how much of your Social Security they're going to tax. And if you have enough provisional in income, you can have up to 85% of your Social Security benefits taxed when they otherwise don't have to be. Well, that's paying more taxes than what you have to pay, and now you're losing those tax dollars and what those tax dollars could become. So those are two, those are the last two big things I wanted to cover with you in the way of, of paying your tax, how you choose to pay your taxes can be detrimental to you. I hope it gets the point across and we haven't talked so fast that it becomes confusing, but certainly people can contact either one of us to go more in depth. Yeah, and let them know where, where they can contact you, Sean, and if they need or want your services and be able to talk to you. Uh, well, uh, the, the blog, I write a lot about this. My last blog post was, are uh, unintended wealth transfers uh, costing you a fortune? And I do an example about prepaying your mortgage uh, and, and, and uh, not taking the savings and doing something else with it and what it can turn into. And that's at my blog, www.wiseandwealthyblog.com. Uh, people can reach me on my mobile number at area code 619-994-1110. They can go to my website at www.principalshield.com. Principal is spelled P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. Uh, and, and then, my, of course, my email address, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at principalshield.com. Those are the four easiest ways to get in touch with me if people have questions or comments. Perfect. And everyone can get a hold of me at www.primalpowermethod.com or contact at primalpowermethod.com. And thanks a lot, Sean, for being on, and uh, look forward to doing our next uh, episode. Hey, thank you for having me. This is a wonderful opportunity for both of us, I think, to, uh, to, to reach people that we care about with, with information we feel is beneficial to them. Absolutely. Thanks again. You bet.